this room, if you are an introvert, is an absolute nightmare. There is no shadowy corner to hide in in this room. But welcome to our catacombs here at Church of Bethesda. If you're wondering what's behind these three doors, it's actually the relics of dead saints are stored in there. Let's take a look afterwards. There's not really, I'm kidding. But thank you for being down here while we remodel our sanctuary upstairs. We'll be down here for a few more weeks. Um, today I want to, as we close out this series we've been going through called The Path, I want to talk about an important topic in our world today, the topic of peace. There's this old story that says, there was once a king who offered a substantial prize to any artist in his kingdom who painted the best depiction of peace. Many artists tried and many failed. After months of submissions, the king had narrowed down the finalists. There were only two and he had to choose one of them. One artist painted a picture of a calm lake a perfect mirror reflecting vibrant, color-drenched mountains all around it. Overhead was a deep blue sky dotted with majestic white clouds, and all who saw this picture thought that it would surely be the one that the king chose as the winner. The second artist painted a picture of mountains too, but they were pale, rugged, and bare. Above the mountains hung a dark, angry sky from which rain fell and lightning flashed, down the side of the mountains tumbled a murky, chaotic waterfall. The second work of art did not look peaceful to the people of the king's kingdom, but the king chose it as the winner anyway. When asked why he chose such a foreboding work to be the greatest depiction of peace in all the land, he responded, because if you look closely, there behind the waterfall is a tiny bush growing in a crack in the rock. In the bush, a mother, a mother bird has built her nest, and there in the midst of the rush of chaotic, murky water, she sits tending her young. What this painting calls peace is that it shows that the perfect place of peace is not one where there's no noise or trouble or hardship. The place of peace is one where in the midst of all those things, one is unaffected by them, going about one's duties in the world anyway. That is the real meaning of peace. Today I want to talk about peace not as a slogan that we post on a bumper sticker or something that we put in a social media post online, but something that is far too valuable to fit into 140 characters or put on a bumper sticker. How do we find peace within ourselves, and more importantly, how do we allow that same peace to extend beyond our interiority into the outside world? Jesus, as he often did when he spoke, chose some words about peace that may leave us scratching our heads. He says in the midst of his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Peacemakers. Why did Jesus choose that word? Why didn't he use the word peacekeepers? Well, because though peacekeeping and peacemaking may on the surface look like they're the same thing, there's really a very big difference between the two. Peacekeeping, if you think about it, is only past or present focused. Peacekeeping is a, a word of maintenance not a word of change. Peacekeeping is about, well, keeping. Peacemaking, in contrast, though, achieves peace by a different means. Peacemaking is always future-focused. It's not a word of maintenance, but a word of action and a word that is open to change. Peacemaking is about, well, making. And just like the two paintings in that story, on a long enough timeline, one of these ways of finding peace wins out in the end. Peacekeeping eventually becomes insufficient at maintaining peace because it only ever looks backwards and says, 
How can we keep, how can we hold on, how can we retain what still remains? Peacemaking, on the other hand, always strives to find new ways to meet new challenges because it never looks backwards and says, how can we hold on to that? Instead, it looks forward and says, how can peace be crafted for the new challenges ahead? And if you think about how we respond to conflict in our everyday lives, it could be in our work, it could be in our relationships, it could even be in our beliefs. We have a tendency to seek peace with a peacekeeper's mindset rather than a peacemaker's mindset. We might be engaged in a conversation with someone with whom we fundamentally disagree. We may even see that their own way of doing something will, in the long run, be unable to meet the real demands of such and such a project or such and such a problem. But because they are the louder voice of the larger personality, we might choose to hold our tongues and keep our opinions to ourselves. Yet in doing so, we fail to calculate the ramifications of our silence. There was a man named Martin Niemler who was a Protestant pastor who emerged as an outspoken critic of Adolf Hitler. And he spent the last seven years of Nazi rule in a concentration camp. And though he eventually spoke up against Hitler, he found that it was far too late. You can hear his regrets in his words when he writes this in his memoirs. He writes, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Niemler looked back at his life and his choices, and he realized that his reluctance to speak truth to power over time became a sanctioning of oppression, not only for himself, but for many, many others. And this shows us something about the flaws in our ideas about peace and conflict and hard conversations. Peace, more times than not, is achieved in how we humbly, but also courageously handle conflict. Not by being silent when conflict arises, not to be right or to win, but because we care more deeply about peace than we do about avoiding hard conversations. And this, maybe more than any other thing, is a lesson that if we will grasp it, can change the entire landscape of our lives and everyone in our circles of influence. By peacemaking instead of peacekeeping, we learn to be a people of just and courageous dialogue. Albert Camus said it best when he wrote, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God, it doesn't mean that they're calling themselves that. It doesn't mean that God is calling them that. It means that other people, by watching their lives and seeing the results of their peacemaking, see them and say, that comes from God. We begin to see that what Jesus is really saying in this passage is that peace is something that is made, not kept. And when we make peace, rather than keeping peace, people can't help but recognize that the kind of peace we are making comes from God. 
I have a good friend named Joel who lives in Austin, Texas now. I don't hold that against him. I don't know why people move to Texas, but they do. But back in the earlier 2000s, Joel and I lived in New York at the same time, and I had the privilege of he and his wife Stacy and their children being members of our church there. They're wonderful, wonderful couple, wonderful people. And as you'll hear in a second, Joel and Stacy, when they were in New York, due to Joel's work, stumbled upon a vast amount of material wealth. They had more money than they knew what to do with. And in the gaining of all their wealth, Joel began to feel confused about what he should do with his life and his faith. All of his material needs were met. He wanted for absolutely nothing. He could donate large sums of money at the drop of a hat to any cause he was passionate about. But something was missing for him in that. Because just giving money away to someone who had as much money as they could ever want, wanted cost him nothing. Let's take a listen to it in Joel's own words. Well, my name's Joel, and I grew up in a Christian household, and uh, I learned a lot growing up about God. But during college, um, I kind of fell away a bit and didn't really do much with God. Instead, spent my time studying and partying. And when I graduated, it was good times. And coming from MIT, there were lots of job opportunities. Got a job with a good paycheck and sort of continued my life from college with just a bigger paycheck. I was unexpectedly offered a job in New York City after a visit. And a few friends in college were running a small hedge fund. And Stacy and I had talked about moving to New York, but this was an actual opportunity and we actually had to decide to go for it. Soon afterwards, we found that the company was largely successful, hugely successful. And the payoff was much larger than Stacy and I had ever expected. So we found ourselves in a different financial position virtually overnight. That brought a lot of new decisions and a lot of conflict in our marriage for deciding how we should change our life in reaction to that, whether we should raise our lifestyle, whether we should give money to new charities, uh, I wasn't ready for that change in position, and I had a hard time understanding what I should do with that money. And part of the difficulty in that decision was realizing that that money was given to me by God. I didn't feel like I had worked hard enough to earn it, although I had worked hard. The bounty that He had given us was just so large that we felt like this was a God thing and we needed to think about that when we decided what to do with the money. Stacy was good at figuring out some charities locally to support with the money. And through those charities, she was a part of the renewal of the city. But in doing that, I didn't feel like I was sacrificing myself at all. I would think about the story of the poor widow who gave everything that she had, and think about how I'd never given everything I had. And now we had so much, it didn't seem possible to give everything we had. I think back to the, in Austin, um, Stacy's parents helped run a food ministry for homeless who would meet every Sunday and, and feed them under the bridge. And I went a few times. You're standing there and there are a bunch of people eating. You can either stick your hands in your pocket or you can go talk to them. And after a few times of doing that, you realize that the only thing keeping you from talking to those people is the fear of talking to them. I learned to connect with the people there and learned how to treat them just like anyone else. The first time in New York that I was able to do something similar, um, I was with my son Gideon, who was 18 months at the time, and we went to Cooper Union. There were a group of homeless people there, and I decided just to start hanging out with them and asking what was up. And it was interesting to see Gideon play with them and talk with them and run around with them and realize that even though this was a man in fishnet stockings and he was wearing women's clothing with a feather vest on, Gideon treated him like any other person. And that was truly eye-opening to how God sees people. After that, I would sometimes sneak out late at night while Stacy and the kids were asleep and just find people on the street, talk with them, laugh with them, hear their crazy stories, uh, hear their aspirations, hear their philosophies. It's always interesting. And some of them have stories about past lovers, about mistakes they've made about their thoughts and how the world works and about how God works. And I enjoyed the time with them that I could feel like I was getting to love someone who I would otherwise just pass on the street. 
One person told me that he had murdered someone, and later Stacy told some of our friends that I had hung out with this guy the night prior, and they were sort of surprised. So it kind of made me realize that not everyone was into this. I started to realize that maybe this was something that God was calling me specifically to do. I first tried to just talk to them about what they'd like to eat, which is the universal language. And then afterwards, it quickly progresses to them telling me what's on their mind. It's, it's hard to make a connection that quickly with anyone in New York, and to make it with someone like that is pretty, pretty spectacular. One of the interesting things I find was how often they're connected to God. They've made a lot of mistakes often and they feel forgiven by God. They have very strong convictions, which is very refreshing in a society where you sometimes hide how you feel. And these people who have nothing, have nothing to lose, and they just tell it like it is. And I'm always just blown away by their witness to me. So I feel like this is one way that I can sacrifice for the kingdom of God. It's not something I had planned to do, it's just something that happened. My time is a scarce resource, and I have kids who wake me up early in the morning, but every once in a while I, I feel this, the urge to go out there, and, and every time I do, I come back home feeling like I've served Jesus. But I still struggle with the fact that I don't always do it. There are many nights where I just don't feel like going out, and I just sit at home and, you know, surf the internet. On one hand, I. I do sacrifice, and on the other hand, I feel like I'm being selfish. That's something that I work to reconcile, how God's promptings can live throughout me in every way, whether it's on the street or at home. Where in your life are you in conflict this morning? Maybe you are, like Joel was, in conflict in one of your closest relationships not because of the other person, but because of the conflict going on within yourself. What we often fail to realize is that that conflict that we have inside of us is God working in you. It's God trying to provoke you to do something original in the world. Not to just jump on the bandwagon with everyone else in your life, maintaining and keeping what's already been done by someone else, but to allow God to inspire you in such a deep way that you begin making peace in the world in a way that only you can. It might look ridiculous. Like Joel going down the elevator from his penthouse on Central Park West. You know how some like rich people have the elevator that goes right into their apartment? That's, I mean, that's folly. That's the kind of apartment that Joel had. Going down his elevator in the middle of the night, walking the streets, looking for people at the very bottom of their lives, and striking up a conversation with them and sharing a meal with them so that they realize that they are seen and desired and loved. It might feel difficult, it might feel intimidating to engage in peacemaking in your own unique way. It will certainly look odd to the people in your life. But to those who are impacted by your peacemaking, they will see God in you. And as you go out into your lives this week, I hope that that troubles you. I hope that that bothers you. I hope that it sticks like a splinter in the back of your mind. I want to encourage you to stop always looking at the safe way and the easy way and following behind the other person that's already done it. And instead, let it agitate you to such a degree that you act on that unique thing in your heart, even if it seems crazy. You are not called to peacekeeping. None of us are. But we as children of God are all called to peacemaking in the world. And I pray that we see that. We will now watch an episode of House of Cards. I'm <laughs>